Well, there were shocking conditions in Adelaide on Friday night, and we saw the Dogs go down by 37 points to the home team, the Adelaide Crows. At the end of round nine, the Dogs sit 13th with four wins and five losses. But on a positive note, they sit just one game in percentage out of the eight. Uh, arguably their best player joins us on the couch, Marcus Bonapelli. Do you mind if I call you the Bond? It seems everybody else does. It's fine, Jared. No worries, mate. How's life at the kennel right now? Four and five, you're just behind the ledger. And you're, uh, you've got a big game coming up Friday night against the Pies. Yeah, we do. Um, it probably wasn't the ideal result on Friday night. We probably built some, some really good momentum off the back of a, a couple of good wins um, and felt like we were really... I guess prepared for the challenge of playing Adelaide in Adelaide and um, albeit I think we got um, some things <clears throat> done really well but unfortunately um, couldn't get a win in the end. Those conditions you don't see too often, we, us older blokes probably saw them a lot, it, it seemed to be you over possessed the footy and over handballed and then I watched the Giants play in windy conditions, they, they couldn't handle a bit of breeze, I mean is it, are you too homogenised, playing in too much perfect condition these days or not? Um, and how did you think you... What was the attitude to playing in that? I mean, potentially we... Um, I sort of can't really remember a game where I've played in that's been that wet and, and constantly raining and, and that heavy. We, you obviously know in the conditions that um, the game becomes a bit more of a territory mm. game. You're, you're focused on probably trying to get the ball going your way, getting it up the field and, and sort of slowly slogging it out. And... Um, we've been a good probably handball team in the past where we've we've moved the ball from inside the contest out quite well through hands and then that has helped our ball movement in the past. Um, but we probably we probably didn't adapt to the conditions as well as we would have liked. I think at times we, we showed some really good patches of, of surging the ball forward, but probably at different times wanted to handball too much and, and that invited Adelaide's pressure yeah. pressure, which I think was was quite good throughout the whole course of the game. Um, but I think next time we'll, we'll probably earn more on the side of getting the ball going forward by foot than you hand. Did, you, did the, you did the warm-up, though, or you just went out on the ground before and it was perfect condition. <laughs> Come back out, it's driving rain. Did, did Bevo or some of the leaders address the group and say, boys, it's going to be really wet now, we need to change our style, or, or just get caught by surprise running out on the ground? No, we did. I felt like our yeah, probably communication, our directives after we got out there and realised that the game was going to be so wet, um, and particularly because of how heavy it was, it was raining, that we... Um, our direction then became around trying to get the ball going forward um, and at times we've been able to do that probably through through handball but um, just probably missed it a tiny bit, yeah. So with your role specifically, and I tend to ask, I guess you've got Dangerfield, you've got Martin now, you've got yourself, who drives the forward mid-mix? I mean, is that solely up to Bevo and the coach's box to say, we want you to go forward? Is it discuss it during the week to say, well, I'll start there but look, feel free to float into the midfield if we're not going well? Who controls that side of it? It's often a, probably a directive from, from Bevo. He'll always um, come to me and we'll, we'll talk about sort of how the previous week worked and then going forward what we feel like might help um, against the, the, the next opposition. Um, but it'll often be probably what he feels will, will help us get the best advantage and, and probably how it sits in the scheme of the rest of the team and, and the team we're rolling with throughout that game. Um, on the weekend we had a, a taller sort of forward line but the previous weekend I was potentially the tallest tallest forward at different times so it'll depend on a couple of different things but um, whatever he sort of sees fit and feels um, will be the best for us is every, how we go. Every time you go forward something happens that's the way <laughs> as an observer either you're kicking goals or you're creating them or making them what effect would it have on you if they if Bevo turned around and said we, we're playing you 90% forward? Oh, I'd be happy to I, I'd it, it's great to be able to play multiple roles, I think, throughout the team and, and, and week to week. It is um, when you're switch hitting and, you know, when you know that there's always... There's, I know a lot of blokes who've been in this position who say, I'm happy to be, be a forward, but mm. knowing full well they can go back to midfield yeah, whenever they want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, starting there, staying there, working through tough times, you know, not getting a lot of footy but staying there, would you still be happy to do that? I think it, the one thing I've probably developed as part of spending a bit more time in the forward line is the, the craft and, and, yeah, and how, how tough the position is to play. It's something I've um, developed the respect and the ability to play forward for longer periods of time. Um, I think it's harder when you probably spend a bit more time in the midfield because of how, uh, I guess, the physical requirements of playing forward, the, the speed, the change of direction, the different elements that probably um, change from playing midfield. So 
I feel like I've got a, a sort of quite a bit of growth in terms of understanding the game as a forward, reading the play, adjusting to once the ball moves. Um, so that's probably one thing I, I probably need to do a bit better. Could so you that, see it happening? Could you see it happening where when we celebrate your career in 12 years' time, we can say he turned into one of the great forwards? Well, I wouldn't go that far. It could, it could, <laughs> it could potentially happen. It, it definitely could. It's all always probably going to depend on how we look up the field as well and. Um, if it means that I can spend a bit more time forward, it means we've got probably enough players that we can rotate through the midfield as well. I think the um, subtext on all of this discussion is Gary reckons that the, mid, the midfields <laughs> are soft and the yes. forwards are no, real the tough. The subtext is if you're going to recruit down the track knowing that he's going to play forward, that's, then you can recruit specifically to cover The it. other subtext is can he make it as one of the great ruckmen of all time, Gary, oh, because yeah. uh, we're seeing him <laughs> trialled in the ruck. And you're showing that it's uh, not that difficult a position. You've got soft hands. You can uh, direct the ball pretty easily. Look at that. Hit out to a disadvantage. <laughs> and then a hit out to disadvantage. And I'm sure we're going to have one here where you actually hit it to somebody. Which I've seen you do uh, many times, including when it mattered most. And that was a grand final. <laughs> um, I probably have had a little bit of experience in the past, having played that third man up role um, prior to probably last season. Um, and it's, it's something we look to do at times we've only got one recognised ruckman but what it also does is give us I guess another midfield option around the ball in the form of a ruckman mm -hmm. so it gives us a, a quite a, a positive attacking sort of position to go in as well um, but as you, you saw there three hit outs to three disadvantage <laughs> hits I'm not sure that we they weren't my selective hitters by the way <laughs> I do appreciate your hand skills but it's not an easy role I want to ask you because everyone tends to be really smart in hindsight and everyone sort of says well Marcus is the best player in that draft or whatever which is um, subjective but I want to ask you what you saw yourself as a player I was a coaching Melbourne at the time and looked at a lot of vision of you and all the other players around tell tell me how you saw yourself going into that draft it was it was quite an interesting year for me throughout that, that the year before I was drafted because I'd, I'd sort of come into the fold quite a bit later I developed a bit later probably than than a lot of the elite players at, at my level. And so I sort of, at the same time, I didn't really know where I was going to fall at all. There was probably reports that I was um, potentially a top 10 pick, but at the same time, I think there are a few clubs that, that definitely saw me falling a bit further back in, 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 the, in the draft. So um, in hindsight, I was always, I think, confident of, of getting drafted. Um, it was always a case of where, where that would be um, that I wasn't quite sure of. I think the closer it got, I had more of an idea of, of where it, it may land, um, but you're never really totally 100% sure. Um, and I think that. I, it's interesting, the point I was trying to make is I think people in hindsight think it's easy, why wouldn't you pick Marcus? Mm. But my information with a couple of really good friends, and I'll be totally honest, one of them said he could be the best player in the draft <laughs> and he could be out of footy in two years. So it was sort of, it, was, it, was a, it was, wasn't a clear cut case, was it? Because you were a bit of a late bloomer in that, in that season. Yeah, well, it, there were probably some, some really positive elements in my game that had shone through throughout the later half of that, that season, but the elements I probably hadn't quite developed yet was the physicality side of the game, and I think they're the things that um, probably the recruiters look at that they can bank on, that players are physical, have got an appetite for the contest. And I think I was still learning how to even use my body. I'd grown quite, quite late as well, and I was still sort of playing even wing, sort of half forward, half back, and I never really spent much time around the ball. So once that sort of happened and I probably showed the, the potential to spend a bit more time as an inside midfielder, I think that's where the confidence came from. Bond, a lot of people would be surprised to realise that you've still got 19 of those 22 Premiership players from 2016 on your list. It's been a big drop off since that grand final day. How can you explain it? I think we, we won young. I think there's an element of, of that that we experienced that I guess the the greatest at, at a young age and the, the team, although the list is, is a bit similar in terms of the 19 players, the team has changed quite a bit and I probably look at the types of players that we've lost and the leaders and the older players that speak to that a little bit more. We were um, obviously graced with having Matty Boyd and Bob Murphy as our recognised leaders of the football club um, and I guess that the evolution of the game and the team has changed quite a bit since then. So. I think we're still understanding um, and maturing as, as a playing group, while we're also probably getting even younger than we were last year. So um, it takes time, I think, to understand that and still build chemistry again. And within the same list, I think we're still we're still getting there. But some really good young players showing some great signs, and I think we're, we're still heading in the right direction. You're a young leader, though. How do you go with uh, a few of the young blokes maybe getting ahead of themselves? Premiership hangover talked about last year now whether that's right or not, only, only you guys know behind the four walls. 
How do you go with uh, disciplining your own fellas and, uh, and, and speaking up in front of your peers that are the same age? Yeah, it's important. It's one of the things that I'm being exposed to sort of each, each day in terms of being a young leader. Um, and I, I most of all probably try and the example I set is always going to be sort of front of front of my mind of how I can best represent myself, the club, and the group, and um, and always be an example for the for the younger blokes. Um, I've been fortunate to deal with some some really great leaders in the past who've, who've helped me understand and learn about conversations and, and how you have those conversations with with players um, if they ever pop up. Now our group's been been really good um, over the last year and a bit, and I haven't lucky, fortunately, I haven't been in that position. To have to have a harder conversation, but um, there's a there's a wide leadership group that we sort of all lean on and discuss um, that at any given time. So I think I'm I'm still learning, but growing in that space of um, how to deal with sometimes a tough conversation. Can I ask you about the ultimate leader, which is your coach Luke Beveridge? I mean, it was one of the most fascinating and uh, most enjoyable flags from the outside. It must have been incredible to be on the inside. Uh, he was put under a bit of pressure early in in the year uh, by our own Tom Morris. He responded and uh, he's continued to lead in uh, his own individual and unique style. He was put in a difficult situation on the weekend and he was damned if he did and he damned if he didn't, but he did do it and uh, he gave himself, or he allowed to have a selfie. He's an unusual man, Luke. Uh, what's the Luke beverage you know? Um, well, in internally, I guess he's, he's very similar. He's, he's a bit um, extrovert. He's, he's, he, the personality side of Bevo is the one thing that I think we all connect with as, yep. a, as a player and, and that's something I think as a, as a player in a football club that you're always looking to, um, yeah, I think repay the faith and, and, and always um, be there for a coach who's always there for you and um, internally we obviously love Bevo and he, he did a great job of handling a situation that um, obviously was a bit deflating after us yeah. losing uh, but that's, 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 his, that's him in a nutshell that he'll give his time up for anyone, um, I guess win, lose or draw in that sense. So. Um, I don't think he had the another... biggest uh, cheesy grin on his face <laughs> in that particular no. one, but he's an interesting watch, your coach, and uh, he's been right at the highs, and this is a great challenge over the next uh, couple of periods. Got to let you go, Bont. Sadly, yeah, we had Patrick Cripps in that chair last week and talked about contracts and how you know, the future of Carlton sort of rests on his shoulders, and, and you're much the same way. You're out into 2019, I think. Mm, when does good. that get revisited for all the dog supporters who are watching this? Yeah, well, I think, like you said, I'm, I've still got a year, and a, a year and a half to go on my current contract, so um, the conversation's already started, so we're um, working through it sort of each day, really, which is the benefit I have is that it's still a year and a half away and I can continue to just play and let the rest sort of play out in so the background. Do you think the power forwards will get more money or do you think the midfielders? That's a good point. Make the, make the move now. <laughs> go now mate. We'll wait and see. It's a big game coming up for you uh, on the weekend. Uh, Collingwood on the big stage... Four and five. If you could square it up into five all, I think uh, plenty of people will be pretty happy with that. Thanks for your time tonight. No worries. Thank you. Marcus Bond and Pelly, our special guest coming up. A message for the Blues from our own...